Hello, I'm here at the Catholic Theological College on uh, Victoria Parade on a beautiful, sunny Melbourne autumn day. And I'm with Reverend Professor Austin Cooper. Father Austin, uh, a big welcome. Thank you, and it's good to be here with you, Shane. Uh, I think uh, we've talked to some really interesting people on the Melbourne Catholic website over the last couple of years. I've got a feeling this might be one of our most interesting discussions. <laughs> well, uh, let's hope so. Father Austin Cooper takes tours around Catholic culture, around church history, and he has a marvellous career in lecturing here at the Catholic Theological College and way beyond. In fact, let's start there because we're here in the Catholic Theological College. What's its history? Because I think you go back 50 plus years here. I do with this place. Oh yes, indeed. In fact, I predate Catholic Theological College. I was part of a committee which was formed by the then Archbishop of Melbourne, Archbishop Knox, to try and get a group of theologians together to plan what might become a united faculty of theology for all the Catholic um, houses of formation and seminaries in the Melbourne or Victorian era. era, right. area. So that was the beginning and that was 1967. And the college of course came into being five years later. So yes, I predate it. Uh, <laughs> so has it always yes. been called Catholic Theological College? Yes, that's right. Yes, okay. Yes. And then explain to me, and I think a lot of people watching will have often wondered the same question as I do, the University of Divinity, where does that fit in and what's its right. history? Okay. Well, at a certain stage, Catholic Theological College joined a thing called the MCD, the Melbourne College of Divinity. Yes. That was established in 1910 by Act of Parliament in Victoria. The various uh, churches in Victoria, excluding the Catholic Church, had wanted to have a faculty of theology at Melbourne University. Right. Melbourne University strenuously resisted any um, suggestion that there be a faculty of theology. They thought theology would merely mean that on the university campus we'd have a whole lot of Christians arguing with one another. <laughs> so they thought that it would not uh, be conducive to peace. So in 1910 the Victorian Parliament passed an act whereby a college could be established comprising any churches that wanted to join it and which would actually be able to grant degrees recognised by the state. So although we couldn't get degrees within the University of Melbourne, we, uh, theologians could get degrees recognised by the state of Victoria, which meant they'd probably be recognised by places outside Victoria itself. Uh, shortly after the establishment of Catholic Theological College, CTC, under the inspiration once again of Archbishop Knox, who really was a very forward-looking man, yes. uh, the Catholic Church joined the Melbourne College of Divinity. So along with the Anglicans, the uh, Methodists, Presbyterians, uh, and, and Congregationalists, who of course later became the United, United Church, Church. Yep. and the Churches of Christ, uh, we joined the MCD, the Melbourne College of Divinity. Now, eventually, the MCD was elevated to the rank of a university. So that's how we come to be part of a university. Well, wonderful explanation and great history. It is. Um, it, it's great history. In fact, on your office door here, I think the title is Church History. That's so right. we are really getting a great lesson here. So am I right that the University of Divinity takes in a Catholic thread and other threads under a truly ecumenical banner? That's right. Look, uh, we uh, at CTC present the Catholic tradition. We have every right to do that within the university. Trinity College, for instance, and the University of Melbourne, uh, which is an Anglican theological faculty, yes. they can present the Anglican tradition. They have every right to do so. So each of these colleges presents its own tradition, but we are all answerable for academic standards to the university. So it really is a wonderful uh, example, if you like, of ecumenism in action. We respect one another, we have every right to present our own uh, Catholic point of view, our own Catholic tradition, but 
we are also answerable that we do that with proper uh, professional standards. So if I signed up to do a Bachelor of Theology or a yes. Master's degree in Theology, whatever it might be, at the University of Divinity, yes. would I, as a Catholic, mainly do the Catholic strand but do some of the others as well, or would I just be down the Catholic path? No, you could do... Well, some people do just stay in, within their own tradition. Yes. And I think when they do, it's very largely a matter of geography. Uh, it's easier to come to one campus than to go to several all I over see. Melbourne, you know, right. because some of these are very widespread. And in fact, one of the uh, component colleges of the university is in Adelaide, so it's very hard mm. to go there. That's mm. the Lutheran College. So um, people do mainly stick to their own college, not, I think, out of any sense of um, you know, narrowness, but really uh, largely because they want to get the Catholic tradition and also it's easy to do it in one place. But people often do do one or two units or subjects at from another, the other tradition. Uh, from the other tradition. So, in fact, I'm sorry, in my classes I invariably have somebody from the other traditions. Wonderful. Um, I usually have, um, in, certainly when I teach Christian spirituality, there's always a fairly you know, good minority of people from other traditions coming to it. So where is the University of Divinity um, placed? Obviously, this is part of it, here this in Victoria Parade, yeah, East yeah. Melbourne. Where else? Well, there are the 11 colleges, which are, um, several of them are around the uh, Crescent up there at Melbourne University, yes. Trinity College, Ormond College, where the Uniting um, Church has the... Uh, their fa faculty or their College of Theology, which now is called um, Pilgrim College. I see. So they're spread out. Of course, YTU is in Box Hill. Salvation Army also is out in, in the eastern suburbs, as are uh, the Coptic Church. They're where they've got what used to be the old um, Carmelite Seminary in Don Vale. Oh, yes. So yes. you probably know that property. So we're spread all over the place, and that's part of the reason why people simply can't commute very easily from one to the other. So in this era of the 21st century, where there's a falling off in Western cultures generally of great living faith and attendance at church and these sorts of things, is there a similar drop in people having an interest in theology and the study of it or in fact is it going the other way i think uh, look i think it's going the other way i think now when i when we began this whole process of um, thinking about a united faculty thinking of theology was largely in terms of thinking of a professional clerical um you know lifestyle but now uh, one of the things that Archbishop Knox was particularly interested in was that uh, a theology faculty would open its riches, if you like, to other to religious uh, sisters and brothers, mm. but also to lay people. And in fact, I think if you went into any class on this campus, you'd find that the majority of people in the class are lay people, not seminarians. Interesting. They're, they're not preparing for priesthood. So does it make you feel a bit excited or special that probably many of our great priests and bishops, nuns and brothers, even lay teachers, have actually been formed by Austin Cooper. <laughs> well, I don't know. There must have been some good friends come through yes, the class. Yes, uh, several of them actually. Several of the bishops were, of course, students here. Who have been your stars? Well, um, you know, there have been people like Archbishop uh, Costello of Perth and uh, Archbishop um, the Archbishop of Canberra. Um, Chris Prowse. Chris Prowse, yes. yes. So, and of course, needless to say, my good friend, the Archbishop of Brisbane, was a student at this college. Excellent. And he was a master of this college also, of course. Mark Coleridge. Yes, Mark Coleridge. So uh, Mark was at one stage uh, deputy master while I was master. And then I retired from the job and he became master and I became his deputy master. <laughs> so we switched roles and worked for... And I think together. Shane McKinlay has that, that oh, job. Oh, Shane McKinlay has yes. that, that job now. Yes. yes. And doing it very well. Well, you have got, and um, I'm sure you, you find it enjoyable to hear, you've got a wonderful reputation as a wonderful teacher, imparter of the whole religious ethos. Can I just swap tracks a little bit from your educating role within the classroom, within the lecture theatre, to your role where you take groups. And I think you've done it every second year for nearly 20 years, I'm told. Um, 
and it's a tour around church history and also the whole Catholic culture. Yes. Tell us a little about what you cover on those tours. Okay, well, look, we have a, a lot of places that we go to. Uh, some of the places, of course, are important because they've had a role in the shaping of Australian Catholicism. Yes. So one of the places we invariably go to is Ireland. Uh, the majority of Catholics in Australia up to the Second World War had Irish background. And uh, it would be impossible to talk about the history of Catholicism in Australia without uh, doing due reference to the church in Ireland. So we usually make Dublin our centre. Yes. And for a week or so, we go from Dublin out to various places, which might show us some of the aspects of uh, the development of Catholicism throughout Irish history and in Australia. One of the places we go to actually in Ireland is Glendalough, mm -hmm. which long predates uh, Australia and Australian Catholicism, but it was a great monastic uh, foundation of over a thousand years ago. And for many years, uh, particularly after the Reformation, it just was a, a heap of ruins. Now it has been revived as a mm. great centre of pilgrimage, and uh, it's a beautiful place to go to in the Wicklow Mountains. So you have both the beauty of the place and also the great history of over a thousand years of um, this being a place of pilgrimage. So it really is wonderful to, to lock into that. And would you know, when you go to Glendalough, one of the figures that you see in one of the arches is a figure of St. Anthony of Egypt. Now, St. Anthony of Egypt, uh, what's he got to do with Ireland? <laughs> well, he's got a lot to do with Ireland because historians are now agreed that Irish monasticism actually stemmed directly from the desert of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? And Egyptian monasticism. Mm. Yes, yeah, so look, it's a, it's a very long evolving history. And here we are, a comparatively new country. We put ourselves right back into a, a stream which has been going on for almost the whole of Christendom. So as you take a tour around, um, and I think it runs over a few weeks. Um, a month usually, uh, yeah, four from, weeks. Yeah. From memory. Um, what are the things beyond Ireland that really okay. excite people and get them really interested? Well, there are lots of places in Ireland that get them interested, of course. Another place, of course, we go to is Scotland. Yes. Because, um, you know, Australian uh, Christendom generally, of course, has, uh, through Presbyterianism largely, but also through Mary MacKillop, of course, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, has got a Scottish background. So we go to several places there. One of the exciting places we go to, uh, not on every tour, but on several of them, we've been to the island of Iona, ah. which is, uh, you know, most beautiful place off the west coast of Ireland. First of all, you have a three-hour beautiful tra train journey through the highlands of Western Scotland. Then you do a 40-minute um, ferry ride across to the Isle of Mull. The Isle of Mull, actually, is a place where Governor Macquarie is buried. He was oh, a Scotsman. Lachlan Macquarie. Yes, that's right. Lachlan I named Macquarie. my first yes. child after so Lachlan you Macquarie. So, know, you know, you get to, to sort of lock into an aspect of Australian history generally. You have then a, a bus ride for about um, three quarters of an hour down the Isle of Mull on a very narrow track. And then you get a second ferry. And the second ferry takes you really just a short uh, couple of kilometres across to the Isle of Iona. Iona. Yeah. Ah. Which once again is a very ancient Celtic monastic foundation. Uh, and at the time of the Reformation, it was actually just simply destroyed. So for 400 years, it remained a, a heap of ruins. Now, would you believe it, it has revived as a place of pilgrimage. Wow. A quite remarkable Presbyterian minister during the Depression got a whole lot of young men in order to give them a job, and he took them over to Iona, and they rebuilt the old monastic ruin. And so the old church, Good which story. had been left without a roof for hundreds of years, has now got a roof on it. There are regular services, and whenever we go there, they allow us to say Mass in the old monastery. So look, these are great. it's a great thrill to be, first of all, in a very beautiful place. The beauty of a place can't be discounted, mm. but also the, the way in which the, the spirit has breathed in that place for all of those years. As T.S. Eliot once said about, about Canterbury Cathedral, you know, years of um, uh, prayer had been 
made valid in this place. Mm. So there's a great history of spirituality in those places. Another place in Scotland, actually, is something which I keep on, I have on my uh, monitor at the moment, Abbotsford in Scotland. Abbotsford was uh, built in the 1800s by a very famous Scots literary figure, Sir Walter Scott. Yes. Now, Sir Walter Scott uh, just had an extraordinary impact on English literature, British literature generally, but also he revived an interest in the Middle Ages, which people had always associated simply with Catholicism and superstition. He showed it to have a certain beauty. Uh, when um, Sir Walter Scott died, the property passed to his daughter and then eventually to his granddaughter. Now, his granddaughter married a young man called Hope, uh, whose uh, grandfather was the Earl of Hopeton, mm. our first Governor General. Mm. Um, young Hope was a student of Cardinal Newman's, John Henry Newman, at Oxford. Goodness and me. he was very greatly influenced by Newman and he eventually became a Catholic. He became one of the most famous and also the wealthiest lawyers of his day. And uh, he was a great, great Catholic figure. So Abbotsford is a lovely place yes. to go to, yes. um, a beautiful place to go to. And I, as an oblator, are interested because um, uh, Sir Jude de Mazenod was a friend of, well, of um, Hope Scott, there you go. who had a house in the south of France near where uh, de Mazenod was bishop. Well, so it all locks in with a whole lot oh, of interesting things. You can keep making connections. Connections, in yes. yes. Uh, somebody sure to know somebody else. <laughs> So um, it all well, works in together. I have three more questions because we Good. could talk here all day and uh, it's fascinating. I'm told you're an expert on the Reformation. Well, what, uh, that's what very, gets you excited about that's that? That's very kind of, of you to say that. Um, I do know a bit about it uh, and I do teach a unit here on what I call the British Reformations, which is the Reformation in England and in Scotland and in Ireland and in Wales. Uh, most people uh, do know something about the Reformation in England because, of course, it was the thing which influenced our the tradition spirit. very, very yep. greatly. Yep. But the Reformation happened in the other three kingdoms of the United Kingdom as well. And each of them is a quite interesting and quite distinct story. And so I like to follow that down. My, my real interest actually is in the 19th century. Okay. With Newman and his followers. So that's my next question. Yeah. I'm told, that, well, in fact, I think you released a book last year on Cardinal Newman. Is that Cardinal right? Cardinal Newman's spiritual yeah. image, yes. And what, just in a very brief answer, because we are running out of time, what makes Cardinal Newman so special in your eyes? <laughs> well, look, he's a very fascinating character. He had a most extraordinary influence at Oxford with his very close friends, John Keeble, who was an Anglican clergyman and professor of poetry and a great poet. Um, Edward uh, Pusey, who was a great scripture scholar and professor of Hebrew. And uh, another young man who unfortunately died, Richard Harold Froud. These four actually tried very uh, greatly to put in a nutshell, to re-alert the Church of England to its Catholic heritage. Right. So one might say that they were interested in showing that the Anglican tradition is Catholic. And of course, Newman eventually found that for him, Catholicism was to be found actually in the Catholic Church. But that movement has had a very profound effect on, first of all, the Anglican Church, also on the Catholic Church. One American historian says, that the modern Catholic Church in English-speaking countries owes its present shape and feel to the Oxford movement, that's mm. human and all those, mm. more than to anything else. That's a really? big statement. It is. Yes, yeah. that's a man called Patrick Allott. Now, a lot of people may disagree with that, but it's a, <laughs> it's a, pay, a point that you could, you could have a good discussion over dinner about that one. <laughs> one last question. Uh, you're an oblate? Yes. Tell us about the oblates, again, just briefly. Oh, okay, good. What, what, what led you to become an oblate? Well, I, um, I, be, lived, I was born and bred in an oblate parish, Sorrento. Um, so uh, when I thought about being a priest and a religious, I had to give some thought to being an oblate. And um, so it was either the oblates, um, when I thought about being a religious, I was educated by the Maoist brothers, so I had to give mm -hmm. some thought to that, but when I thought of being a priest, it was the Oblates. And what is the history of the Oblates? Well, the Oblates were founded just after the French Revolution by Eugene de Massenod, who became Bishop of mm. Marseille, in order to try and recover something of the 
extraordinary destruction of the Catholic Church in France during the Reformation. You know, the, the, the Church came virtually to within a fraction of just simply being Dying totally out. destroyed. Uh, out, yes. yeah. And so France became a great missionary country, really, from the uh, end of the Napoleonic Wars onwards. So de Mazenod's a part of that, but then de Mazenod answered the, um, the plea to, to go to the missions as well. So he had a very broad heart and a very great interest. So, um, Well, I must say, that's been a fascinating chat, Reverend Professor Austin Cooper. Um, what, what, what can't he do? Anyway, <laughs> well, if someone wanted to travel with you, do you know off the top how they might be able to make an inquiry or would yes, there be a well, website they could go to? The best thing, well, I think we do have a site, yes. Uh, the two as are mentioned in the CTC website, but also you could con contact us here at CTC and we'll give you some more information about what might be coming up in two years' time. So CTC, for those of the uninitiated, stands for Catholic Theological College. So Reverend Professor Austin Cooper is the man. It's been a really fascinating chat and lovely Good. to meet Thank you, you again. Thank you very much, Shane. Good and you. Uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed uh, this chat here on the Melbourne Catholic website.